Hello everyone, and sweet Christmas, have we got a good episode for you today. <laughs> yes, we are discussing the season one of Luke Cage. So, what are your overall impressions now that you've watched all episodes? I enjoyed it, mm-hmm. first and foremost. I've been watching it quite staggered. Mm-hmm. So, I've really been just sort of taking it in like three or one episode chunks. But when it grips me, it definitely gripped me. Mm-hmm. But it didn't quite grip me enough to sort of push everything to the side and go, I'm just going to sit here and watch all this now. Would you have watched it in patches because of the quality? Or if you didn't have work, would you have just watched it as a normal TV show? I'd have probably set aside an afternoon every day and watched like four episodes okay. and, have it, yeah, and yeah. have it done in like three days. Because I don't really like to binge entire days worth of stuff. Like mm-hmm. I like to have something to come back to. Well, I think that shows a lot that you enjoyed it because you, regardless of what you did, you would have put those days aside. So that's good. Mm-hmm. I think I've, I feel the same about it. The first four episodes for me were the worst, probably. I, I really struggled to carry on after that, but I'm really glad I did. Yeah. Because it picks up so much as, basically, spoiler alert in this, in this particular video. After Pop dies, this series picks up big time. Pop dies? <laughs> I'm only <laughs> on episode three. Sorry, should have prepared for this. <laughs> <laughs> No, seriously though, this takes a, a massive turn. I haven't seen this sort of um, quality difference in a while on a TV show, and it really makes me glad I stuck with it. Yeah, it's a shame for me because I actually quite liked Pop as a character. Yeah, he was cool. But um, yeah, this show's got quite a few um, a few good changes of pace or beats, where just as you think it's getting a little bit dull, like samey. And, yeah, yeah, it doesn't quite hit those beats as much as say Breaking Bad, where instantly as soon as you're bored. Something happens and something goes down. Yeah. This show isn't quite as good, but more or less, you kept it at a solid pace. This is definitely more of a s- slower and plodding series, mm-hmm. which could work to some people's advantage if they're not too familiar with like Marvel and comic For sure. books. I mean, it's still watchable regardless of what, what Marvel series is you watch. It's just a good show in general, I think. Mm-hmm. So I want to move on to Luke Cage himself, Mike Coulter. Now, I'm kind of iffy on his performance. I thought he was good, but... Then again, how much can he play with this like relatively quiet, muscly person whose whose development is quite slow because he doesn't doesn't gravitate towards the role of superhero until the very end. So I suppose mm. his his acting was limited in that sense. But what did you think of the way he portrayed Luke Cage? Well, I do agree with you for the most part because in the first four episodes he doesn't show much heroics mm. and it is just a slow lead up until he eventually takes over like the Luke Cage mm. persona and it's really only until we get the episode where he has the flashback to the to his days in prison and gaining his superpowers and wearing the that tiara <laughs> and wearing the, the, the tiara and the, the uh, wrist thing when, when he shirt. when he finds that shirt he just looks at it like Seriously, like it's like he's looking at the producers and going, "Seriously, you p- pick this out for me?" And he's got the big, he's got the hair as well. It's just... can you imagine that conversation with the producers when he they said you're going to be location? He googles it and he goes, and "He's like, I'm going to be this guy." And they go, "Don't worry, you're going to wear hoodies." <laughs> it's it's like I imagine it's the same thing is when um uh who's who's so played uh, the Scarlet Witch just looked yeah. at all those costumes and it's like. Yeah. No, 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 it's fine. You're just going to be wearing normal clothes. <laughs> It'll be fine. Yeah, we're not in the 70s anymore. It's okay. <laughs> but, um, I did like his performance because you said he's quite a stoic person. Mm-hmm. I'd rather have him be that than, say, like a Punisher kind of person where he's like all out, full on yeah. angry, full on angry all the time. Because he says... He has uh, a conscience. Yeah, yeah, and he says, uh, I want to be the Captain America of Harlem. Mm-hmm. That's and, a cool example. Yeah, yeah, and that's not just, you know... He's like, oh, I'm a superhero. It's like, you know, he's not just he's not just saying, I want to be a superhero. He's saying, I want to represent what Harlem is and I want to do justice, which is why he doesn't say, I want to be the Iron Man or yeah. I don't want to be the Thor. It's like, I want to represent the people. He's, he's definitely not a numbskull or anything. Not like your classic, like big, stupid piece of iron. He's and got a yeah, lot more to him than and that. He, and, he's not, and he's not like lovable giant with a heart of gold material. Mm-hmm. He's like a flawed He's definitely person. more complicated than that, mm-hmm. but nevertheless, you know, he's a new character. You've got to take time for people to get used to him. And because he's such a subtle person, it takes even more time. Like with Tony Stark, with the first 10 minutes, you know what you're going to get with Iron Man. Mm-hmm. You know, at the end, he's just going to be this big brash person who says that he he's going to tell everyone he's Iron Man. Mm-hmm. Whereas Luke Cage, that's not going to be the case. He's going to going to wait for people to find out about him rather than tell people exactly what he he is like. 
Yeah, and also he's um he's a it's quite interesting. You know, you said I uh, talk about Iron Man. His actions speak louder than his words. Luke tries to use words a lot often more than actions. I find. I I, like... I think it's the opposite in a way. I think he's he's such a quiet person that he'll let his his actions. They're always good actions. That he'll always sort of fix a fix a situation then just walk away from it rather than take the plaudits. Yeah. I think that's what he does. See, I'll use the example that um, when he's uh, uh, roughing up one of Diamondback's goons, mm-hmm. is where he is holding him up, you know, like about five foot in the yeah, air. Yeah, yeah. But he's saying, like, tell me tell me where he is. It's only after that that he throws him into the dumpster. And God, just... I love that scene. <laughs> just crushes and or just pins it to his Collections on Tuesday. I think the, the subtlety of his character makes those moments so much better just because you don't expect them. <laughs> and importantly, that's towards the end of the series and that's when he grows into that persona. Yeah. And, you know, for Defenders, he's going to be a bit more confident. He's going to be a bit more brash, but still maintain that consciousness, which is, yeah. I think is really good for Mike Colter himself. We briefly mentioned Misty Knight and how much I appreciate her performance. But what did you take from her? She is the typical, like, female cop. What do you mean? As in, like, she's the typical, like... Careful. <laughs> since she's the... So, no-nonsense, like, about the... It's the case, the case, the case, the yeah, case. Okay, yeah, yeah. Like, that's going to be the follow-through. Okay, it's now always you've Luke. ruined her for me. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> it's always it's always about Luke or the case or mm-hmm. whatever the immediate situation is. Mm-hmm. You do get, like, a little corny moment. It's like in the second episode when... Uh, there's those kids playing basketball, and she's oh, like, she's like, say. she's like, oh, I, can, she's, um, if I can score three hoops against you, it's yeah. like, it's like, I know she's gonna win anyway, but come on, like, I'm already invested. You don't need to. I mean, that that was kind of important because it showed her that that her character is from Harlem. She's rooted in it, and that's why she yeah. cares so much. So you can see why she's is rooted in the case, and in such support of Luke because he's doing what's good for Harlem mm-hmm. rather than anything else. But another supporting character, Night Nurse. Now, for someone who's watched um, a Daredevil and Jessica Jones... Yeah, I'd just like to put out, I've only watched Luke Cage out of all the Marvel TV shows so far. I can't wait for you to watch the, the other two. Well, the other three, because there's two series of Daredevil. Yeah. But anyway, it's so nice to see her development in there, because you get sort of characters like um, Scarlett Johansson's Black Widow, who are in a few movies, never in her own. And just for a few hours at a time, and you never get really a, a fantastic sense of exactly what her motives are and exactly what she's like. Mm-hmm. Whereas in a TV show, when you've got that repetitive character, I think it really works well, and, and I appreciate that they've <coughs> put that in to then go into the Defenders and have a really sort of like nice cohesive team together because mm-hmm. of the sheer amount of hours that they've given to every member, even the supporting cast. Yeah, I'm not going to say much on Miss Tonight because I didn't really find her that Night Nurse. Sorry, didn't find her that engaging. St- stupid Marvel names. <laughs> I didn't find Night Nurse that engaging personally, but I think that might be due to me not having. Mm. The prior experience, because when she's introduced, she does ref- she does reference Jessica. I suppose to you, having not seen them, she's just a means of moving the plot forward mm-hmm. rather than anything else. Yeah, she's a good change of pace. She's a change of pace when needed. Mm-hmm. And the performance is fine, more or less, but at that point, you've already sort of introduced me to everybody else. Yeah. So, but I I'm suppose really to talking others. about her moving the plot forward, you could also say that Missy Knight is in that sense, because... From the from the middle of the season, you sort of know that she's always going to be on Luke Cage's side, mm-hmm. which towards the end of the season just becomes so important because everyone's against him. You see, apart from the general public, really, like these, some of them are, f- are for him and, and they buy the hoodies for him and they help protect him. Mm-hmm. But in general, the people that matter, the police force and Diamondback and his goons and the, the rest of the general cartels are against him. And her, her sort of proclamation of his innocence is so important and and in that sense you can see that she was a means to an end there but because of the performance of of the person who played her i thought she just sort of grew from that Mm, so much definitely so like leading on to that talking about the resistance of uh herself against everybody else Mm -hmm. at at various points of the show you want to talk about harlem as an entity in itself as the harlem (laughs) character essentially yeah because um you'll notice that as you're watching the series that Harlem's probably the most Harlem, aside from Luke, is probably the most referenced thing in this entire show, mm. because every character in passing mentions about "I'm doing this for Harlem." I'm said Harlem's against you, Luke. Like Harlem's got your back, whatever. The characters reference Harlem almost as if it's another character, and I think this is one thing that we've definitely picked up that Harlem, in its way, is its own entity because. Mm. 
it's always mentioned in passing, and each character, it starts off by each character talking about what Harlan means to them. Because I think the very first time you see uh, Mariah Dillard, mm-hmm. she's, to- she's obviously talking about, you know, Harlan means to me, like, as a f- uh, diverse, uh, yeah, co- yeah. So, such rich cultural background. Then you've got characters like Pop and uh, Cottonmouth. Harlan means something very different to them. Mm, each character takes something they want out of it. For example, Cottonmouth <laughs> takes the, the seedy side of it, the bad side, to sort of get his personal gain from it with mm-hmm. his racketeering and sort of weapons dealing and stuff. Whereas Luke will take the good side and he'll... In, and even though he's not even from there, but he, he knows just how rooted the community is and he'll take that good community feel from it as well as Pops. Exactly. Exactly. So it's interesting seeing all these characters, no matter how different they are, mm-hmm. sort of rooted in that background and knowing that they all have that in common and that there's some degree of similarity between them like it's not it's not just purely black and white here you're getting a spect you're getting a spectrum of the city and not only that but as i said earlier that harlem's like an entity in itself opinion of luke is gauged in by harlem's actions Mm -hmm. so just the very start when he's starting to gain traction then when he gets framed and harlem's against him but i like that at any point in the series, no one is entirely for or against Luke. Yeah, you always get people in the street shouting, like, hey, Luke, you're, you're doing a really good job, or, or people saying the complete opposite. It's never, like, full support until the very end when he's in that fight with Diamondback, when everyone's just rooting for him and know that he's going to win. Yeah, even when he's being uh, being uh, chased down by the police and there's that one officer who says, like, y- I-, I know I know who you are. Mm-hmm. I-, I know you've um, you worked in Pop's shop. Yeah, yeah. You know, there's, there, it's never what full hate and full against, which is such an easy trap. I think the writers could have fallen into, Definitely. but I'm really glad they didn't. Especially with the voice of the general public, <laughs> it's really easy just to have a big crowd of people just to go, "We hate you." Mm-hmm. But because that never happens, you always get separate voices saying their own opinions. That makes Harlem so much more complex because they all contribute to that character. Yeah, it's also nice seeing that it's Harlem mm-hmm. rather than necessarily. Uh, say something in the Avengers where like New York, York for example. it never feels like New York it looks a lot like New York but it's an it's an entity to get destroyed yeah, it's just a playground isn't it yeah it's a it's a yeah, it's a sand it's a sand pit mm-hmm. just to get absolutely wrecked or uh, this the place in Age of Ultron which got destroyed yeah, as well which no longer exists because it's destroyed exactly yeah <laughs> or or any other yeah. climactic superhero thing it's a it's a city you get a real sense of where you are here Essentially, yeah. whereas in, in New York, you you never on the ground with all the tourists or anything like that. You you never or with the businessmen. We're here. You know exactly where you are. You know exactly how the general public feels, which is why we talk about this voice that mm-hmm. look at the Harlem character has. Should we also talk about the celebrity appearances? Oh man, this makes it so cool. <laughs> yeah, I know. So um, in the show, like because it takes because they're saying it takes place in Harlem, we're getting celebrity cameos from real Harlem celebrities, such as uh towards the end of the series. Uh, there's a show called Sway in the Morning where a uh, guy's talking about Luke and he starts making a rap about him. Sway is an actual person mm-hmm. um, who I lis- used to listen to years and years back. So when I saw him, I was like, that, that, that's actually pretty cool, that is. <laughs> and uh, there's another celebrity he meets in the, st- the street. I can't remember who he is, though. There's a cool interaction with the one you're talking about because the celebrity meets Luke, the rapper, who's yeah. on the Sway show. And he'll go, you're Luke Cage. And he'll go... You and Luke will go. You're so and so, and it's like this thing. Like they're both just as famous as each other, and that's important for Luke because he realizes just how much this community relies on him. Because if you think of the roots of Harlem in music, and just how important that is, and for Luke to be on that level, that really shows his status. Leading on from music, mm. should we talk about the soundtrack? Oh, it's. I, I mean, I'm not personally a fan of this sort of music, but I am after this series now. Yeah, I I started I started noticing like um the backdrop of Harlem Paradise. Mm-hmm. They're all real musicians as well and a lot of them get like stealth released songs on it. But you also do get a few big people just turning up yeah, and yeah. recording for who knows what. <clears throat> you also get a nice reason to have like a soundtrack while uh, say Cottonmouth and uh, Dillard are talking. It's nice having a soundtrack be actually implemented quite well. It's a great change of tone because you can have all sorts going on in the street outside but as soon as it's almost like the Switzerland of Pops Barbershop as soon as you go in there, you know that everything's forgotten, apart from the upstairs bit where all the deals go down. But yeah. the people go in there, they just have a good time, and you really get a sense of that. Mm-hmm. Talking about the Harlem Paradise, and I want to move on to Cottonmouth and the villains of the series. Mm-hmm. They start off, I mean, with Cottonmouth and Diamondback, they're essentially polar opposites. 
because you know Diamondback go head to head with Luke in the big slugfest whereas um, Cottonmouth can never do that he has to find other ways to hurt Luke in sort of killing pops or not that he specifically meant to do that but in sort of backhanded ways mm. and you get the sense of that as when he's just murdering this this guy on, on the first episode just blood going everywhere there's the, the, the deliberate Biggie Smalls imagery which like yeah. I, it was so phoned in but I liked it yeah, you know exactly <laughs> how this guy deals you know he's, he's always sort of shying away from conflict using other people to do his work for him see when I found out he's that kind of, like okay he's, the, he's a kingpin mm-hmm and he's a guy in the background. I thought, how long can they go away for this until Luke... Like, this is about three episodes in. I thought, how long can this go on for until Luke just has enough of it and just bursts and just breaks straight into his door and just mm-hmm. says, this is it now. Because unlike a lot of other um, villains, villains and hero interactions, we do see a little bit of, like, street-level interaction mm-hmm. where, such as at Pop's funeral... Where obviously they full on know they're each other's in each other's business, but there's an element of respect mm-hmm, for sure, and that you know our our things are between us, and we don't we we're not going to put massive people at harm. I think Cottonmouth even sort of apologizes, sort of yeah, yeah, yeah. in a to for a couple of the uh, kids' deaths because it wasn't intentional, and then you get a real <laughs> sense of his because he's sort of a bit one dimensional up until the flashback scenes, which unfortunately is his. Is the episodes where he gets his best development and you really sort of care about his character then he just gets guilt I don't like that I really think that's a bit of poor writing because mm. as soon as it's just cheap to sort of give us a bit of sympathy before he dies I would have liked to have seen interaction between him and Diamondback more because I think because they're so such different personalities it would have been interesting to see how that would have gone maybe they would have gone against Luke together, maybe they would have just clashed together and, and fought each other. Because I know he was sort of working for him, but Diamondback was never really in the in the scenes at any yeah. time. But interestingly from that, you never see Diamondback until halfway through the season, but you hear so much about him that when he turns up, you know exactly what you're going to get. You know the switch is going to be flicked to Bible preaching <laughs> we, badass. You know that there's a, there's a giant switch somewhere in like the Marvel Netflix office which just goes, which has got realism and comic book. Yeah, it, <laughs> It's it, like, okay then. <laughs> let's go for comic book because the only comic book elements really up until that point are Luke Cage's sort of impervious skin and yeah. super strength. And the, and the uh, yeah. boot Judas bullets. But yeah. that's, but that's pretty, about, that's about it. it. That's the thing with this show is that this is a relatively good show to introduce uh, non-comic book fans to because it mm. is so more or less grounded in realism because a lot of the show is dialogue mm. and a lot of it takes place in bars, in Harlem's Paradise, in barbershops. Just in, familiar uh, yeah, scenarios, in, isn't it? In police yeah. headquarters, like, really familiar scenarios. It's only every now and again when Luke like lifts up a washing machine mm. or holds up a building that you get the comic book elements yeah. until Diamondback comes in and it's just... Yeah, <laughs> it, it it took me a while to sort of acclimatize to this because it's essentially like having season one as Cottonmouth and season two as Diamondback. It's so it's such a different tone, mm-hmm. and I wasn't sure at first. I really wasn't. So I watched it for a few episodes, going, "Okay, then we'll get used to this guy," and then it really pays off towards just, the end. I've just got the image of his uh, his grinning face going, "Hello, brother." <laughs> just, so it, this could have gone so bad. Such I think a, such a cheese fest at some point. <laughs> it could have gone so like. Yeah, it's it's a hell of a risk. I mean, you got to say that. It's a hell of a risk to swap out the v- villain of the show and just be like, "Here's another one." Yeah, <laughs> hope you like it because <laughs> so it, it's almost like they've gone. We'll sack these producers and writers <laughs> and let's hire some other ones. It's not that that's necessary because it was still all right before then. I know, <laughs> but uh, I love Diamond Back because I I really like Carl. I actually quite gravitated towards him. Mm-hmm. This is before the, the forced development as well. I guess that's why you were, you were so like, <coughs> like pissed that he just got slashed yeah. so quickly. So uh, I, I I thought he was fine. Then we got Diamond back and I was like, okay, this is interesting. But when he starts to be like just pure unhinged Yeah, you can't help mad, but laugh at some it's point. Like, it's like, okay, then this is it. We finally got a guy who's just willing to go mm-hmm. up and like actually do stuff. Mm-hmm. So one character that we have missed out that for me is quite divisive, is Mariah Dillard, the councilwoman. Now, at first, I really didn't understand her motives and the way she went about things. And that especially um, happened after she killed Cottonmouth, because I thought she'd just go full 
sort of warlord and take on everyone. Yeah. But she still does sort of <laughs> underhand tactics and things, which I, I thought was a bit easy for her character. See, the thing is, like, you sort of know, you know what you're getting in with this character anyway, because it's Madam Council, Madam Council woman, I'm here for Harlem and I'm here for the city and I'm here for growth. Then you start off like, okay, she, yeah, she's she is related to a crime lord. She she says all of that for her own gain, though. She doesn't. Yeah. She, she she doesn't care about Harlem. I don't think she just cares about. I know. Her, yeah. her image of Harlem. I know that. Uh, that's what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. Like, mm-hmm. this is the kind of character we're getting to start off with. Mm-hmm. Then becomes more cynical, more cynical. Best part about her character is when she's being interviewed. Yeah, when she gets destroyed. And you see that you see the chink in the armor. The thing and is, that's it. Even after that, she recovers <laughs> so well. And she she has two weak moments in the interview and when she's in the police station in the last episode. Mm-hmm. And even after those two scenarios, she comes back even stronger. I'd argue at the end of the season that she's at her strongest and she's like the main protagonist for what comes next. Yeah, the the only thing with her is that, you know, she is the recurring, so let's just call her a side villain for this mm-hmm. part. And like I said, when she does kill, when she just completely ice Cottonmouth after... She gets a little bit of development as well. We, we find out what her uncle did to her. Mm-hmm. You do expect her to just be like, that's it. I'm taking over this place. I'm going to see. I'm gonna shoot Luke Cage personally mm-hmm. because I've lost everything now. But then Diamondback takes that craziness that's forward. That's true. And he, he's the moment where the, the plot gets a little bit crazier and a little bit stranger. So maybe I'm slightly harsh on her, expecting her to be this sort of big kingpin-esque sort of Wilson Tusk, sort of, you'll know this from yeah. Daredevil, but any um, sort of character, <coughs> whereas that's just not what she does. She, she's underhanded. She suits Shades as his as her help really well yeah. because he knows exactly how these things work. And that's really shown in the in the last episode where they, they try to give Luke Cage his paperwork to say that this is why you, you shouldn't have gone to prison. This is your innocence. Rather than just going going at him and trying to beat him up and, or, or, or for example, killing... Like one of his family members or something like that. Yeah. They, they go for the resolution that that's damage limitation for them. So you mentioned earlier about the interview with Misty Knight in the last episode. Now I want to reverse back from that and go on to the last fight scene where Diamondback <laughs> is wearing like this Justin <laughs> Hammertech onesie. <laughs> no, I, I, no, 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 no. I want to go back. <laughs> While we're talking about how stupid Gotman can be, I want, I want to go. So, so uh, Diamondback. I want to go back to when he starts framing Luke Cage. Oh, and he's no. got and he's got the prototype <laughs> of the, the suit. And he just goes up to a policeman, like, knocks him out, and oh. just goes, I'm Luke Cage. Because <laughs> just walking around the street going, I'm Luke Cage! I'm like, Luke Cage! Like, how can people believe he's just wearing this hood and he, and then people are like, okay, he's Luke Cage. <laughs> <laughs> he's like, he looks nothing like him, and he's oh, nowhere God. near as muscly, but... <laughs> and that's the conduit for everything else in the second. I'm, I'm crying looking back at that. <laughs> it's, the, uh, it's how everything like this is what I mean by when we're talking about him being a comic book villain he follows by comic book logic it's I, like, I can't believe I'd forgotten to mention that that's, that's one of the, like the, talk about plot holes <laughs> <laughs> on that last fight scene it's like they've gone <laughs> to like level 10 on the Marvel comic book switch because he just like big slug fest in the, nice that it, it's really nice that it's in the middle of a street it's not this big cityscape that oh yeah yeah but still, you've got this Bible preaching guy in this weird onesie powered suit that somehow absorbs bullets and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not a massive fan of the resolution, but the fight in general was re- I really enjoyed it. It was nice because while it was, it, it's going to be about boxing and it, to a degree, it was a slugfest as well. Mm. It's it, nice that it was quite contained because I know you're going to, I know you're going to bring up an example of like, <laughs> oh, the Hulk and Abomination boss fight. Yeah. Fight. But at the same time, Going back to how it's just on the street, Hulk versus Abomination was a bit boring because it's like once you've seen one building, like just yeah. tr- once you've seen one thing get trashed, you've seen another ones. But this is just two guys fighting. Yeah, they're both super powered, and yeah, they get knocked into like the side of the road. But it's more or less kept quite tight and quite snugly compact between it's them. It's really reminis- reminiscent of actually heavyweight boxing, like you say, because you've got to sort of fake your opponent into thinking that you're tired, and then you lay them out when they're tired. Mm-hmm. And that was a lot of what we got there, like. 
rather than the resolution being that he, he gained power from Luke's hate. It was maybe that he was actually tired from all the hitting that he did, like the rope dope technique, mm-hmm. which makes it sits better for me if I think of it like that. <laughs> Rather than just, I've removed the anger. And yeah. It's just... <laughs> but it was really cool oh, to okay, see. Okay, producers, <laughs> fine, I'll believe that. <laughs> it was cool to see the surrounding people, essentially Harlem, all like chanting Luke's name. But not only that, but they were never worried. It was always, they always knew that Luke was had this in control and was going to win. There was ne- there was, and that portrayed to the audience that there was never any doubt in this. I also like that, you know, this entire series kept it at the street level, mm-hmm. and I'm really glad it ended at the street level. Where it, sure. This could have easily been taken into, like, some, like, burning building. Like, and it, it could and have, like, suit and everything. Like, jumped into Manhattan or something, but it was kept in Harlem, sorted out on the streets of Harlem, which... Yeah, and having having the spores there as well, I think, because otherwise it would have been pretty boring to see two... <laughs> two... Okay, it wouldn't have been pretty boring, because... <laughs> you still got Diamondback in the onesie. Maybe we could have got Luke in the tiara and Luke the yellow oh. jacket as well. <laughs> I, That's like Nerdvana. Oh. <laughs> okay, <laughs> maybe next season. We, we, we'll we write like a letter to the people. <laughs> go, Please come with you. <laughs> Should we like write it like, you know, with the R's backwards? <laughs> dear, <laughs> dear, dear DC. <laughs> <laughs> they'll never reply to us ever again <laughs> yeah final thoughts on the show then it's interesting from a person who's watched the sort of Daredevil and Jessica Jones as well mm-hmm. because I think you take what you get take what you've experienced from this show because in in Luke Cage if you're from Harlem if you if you resonate with that sort of music or those those sort of people then you take a lot more from the show than we do from like the whitest of white places like mm. we just we take the show from what we see rather than what we've experienced. Definitely. And the same with Jessica Jones. If you've experienced those sort of things and if you've been in those scenarios, you, you take a lot more from that show. Mm-hmm. Whereas in Daredevil, it's sort of just like completely sort of out of everyone's league. You just you just see it as a spectacle as it is. And it's really interesting to see Yeah, that. you're not meant to relate to, to it. To not only see those comparisons, but to see people getting different um, views of Luke Cage. Because I've seen sort of mixed reviews, people saying that they've, they've just left after half the season. People... Just stuck with it and absolutely loved it, like it was there's like it was pe- their there's life. There's people who didn't get to see Diamondback. <laughs> like they, they, <laughs> we we got to get a hold of those people and say watch it again. Or there's people who were just like us, middle of the road, sort of like it's a good show, watch mm. it, but we can't relate to it as such. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. However, this the one of the great things about this show, which is nothing to do with the producers, mm-hmm. although they do hint to it a little bit, is that this show came out at the perfect time mm. it, it couldn't have been made like this 10 years ago could it because of the themes that are involved you're getting the themes black lives matter runs through the show not as like a an overall theme but it's mentioned like once i think one of the characters does very deliberately say it's so rewarding seeing a black guy who can't a, a black guy standing up for harlem where you just can't get shot for sure and that that's a very obvious tie you'd think that marvel and netflix you know being quite family companies would try yeah, with, and stay with away their from formula that. and things but at least in their tv show they've got that they seem to have some sort of license because of like i mentioned the um the issues that they bring up in jessica jones are very raw and they've done something quite similar here which is really important and nice to see that the formula is not transferring from the movie universe and and it's not like this relatively stale plot that's going on it's they've yeah. got much more depth to it which it's is... not just this formula on a smaller screen like they're, they're trying other things they're trying a bit of drama they're trying a bit of uh this sex there's more extreme violence there's uh swearing in it and it's nice seeing the shows can successfully do that mm-hmm. for sure so yeah final thoughts i really enjoyed the show mm-hmm. uh first i'm probably going to enjoy it more on repeated viewings than i am there's a lot the of subtleties one. to take from it. Like now that I've done a bit of reading into the show, uh, there's lots of things that I just ignored. Like we say, because we're not in- inclined to see those sorts mm-hmm. of things because we're not from that background. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Th- this show is really worth your time. There's a lot. Of, there's a lot of other ways you could spend 13 hours of your life. But but I'd recommend doing this. <laughs> yeah, definitely recommend this. <laughs> Thanks so much for watching. I, no, I can't wait to watch those um, uh, Diamondback scenes now when he's. <laughs> proclaiming that he's Luke Cage and I hope that you go and watch those too and we'll see you next time thanks but, for watching bye